today we share the story of the Dover 8, a group of freedom seekers who spent the early parts of their lives as slaves in Dorchester County, Maryland and traveled north together in hopes of earning their freedom. Word of their escape made national news in 1857, with newspapers up and down the East Coast reporting the event. Abolitionists celebrated the journey of these eight brave men and women as a great victory for the cause of freedom. Slave owners in Maryland were left humiliated and angry, and they resolved to keep their slaves from ever leaving them again. Like many other stories in African American history, it has largely been lost to time, but not anymore. If you enjoy stories of heroism in the face of danger, their story is for you. If you want to find out how slaves fought back from oppression and struggled for freedom, keep watching and subscribe to our channel to discover our world in a meaningful way. The group was made up of six men and two women that had been enslaved near Bucktown, Maryland, neighbors of Harriet Tubman before her first escape in 1849. In fact, it is believed that Tubman herself sent them instructions on how to make it to freedom. The message likely relayed to them by her father Ben Ross and Samuel Green of East Newmarket, Maryland. Henry Prideaux was 27 years old when he escaped to freedom in 1857. According to William Steele's description of him, he was a giant of a man. Stout and well made, Steele went on to say that he was dark skinned and no fool. His commanding presence would prove to serve he and his companions well on a journey with many bumps in the road. Prado decided to run to freedom when his slave master, Eris Spence, threatened to sell him. The fear of sale was a huge motivator for many when they chose to run away. Most sales forced the slaves further south and forced them to cut times with anyone that they ever knew or loved. It was because of this that Henry Prado took a chance on freedom. Tom Elliott and Denard Hughes were owned by Pritchett Meredith a farmer in Bucktown whose home is now a stop on the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway. Soon after their escape, Meredith placed an advertisement in the Baltimore Sun offering $600 for their return. Meredith believed that they were headed to Wilmington, Delaware to meet with Elliot's uncle, a free man by the name of Moses Pinkett. That lead and the reward money would make it harder for the eight to find their way to freedom. In his book, The Underground Railroad, William Steele described the 23-year-old Elliot as well-made, wide awake, and of a superb black complexion. William Steele also described Hughes as well-made, but of a dark chestnut color and intelligent, possessing an ardent thirst for liberty. When asked why he chose to escape slavery, Hughes cited his master as being the hardest man around, and Meredith's wife as a person who drank hard and was very stormy. Hughes also mentioned that he worked hard in all sorts of weather, so he thought he would go where colored men were free. James and Lavinia Wolfley were a married couple that ran away with the group. Both were slaves of Samuel Harrington of Cambridge. Another of Harrington's former slaves described him as an ill-natured man who was a member of the old-time Methodist church. He had five or six slaves, and when one escaped a few years prior, he threatened to sell them all. The fear of being separated was likely a major cause of their escape. Little is known about the other members of the group. Two of them were Bill and Emily Kaya. The eighth has never been reliably identified. After setting off on their journey north, they likely stopped at the East Newmarket home of Samuel Green in the cabin of Harriet Tubman's parents on Poplar Neck near Preston. Navigating the wilderness on their journey, they were instructed to meet up with a man by the name of Thomas Otwell when they got close to Dover, Delaware. Otwell was a free man who knew Harriet Tubman and was believed to have helped her on several of her journeys through the tiny mid-Atlantic state. But by the time the eight had reached Dover, there was a well-advertised $3,000 reward for their capture. Tasked with taking them to Station Master William Brinkley's house in nearby Camden, he instead conspired with a white man by the name of James Hollis to turn the eight runaways in and collect the reward. Upon meeting up with the group, Otwell took them under the cover of night straight to the Dover Jail where they met with Hollis. The Dover Jail is no longer standing. Our first clue to where it used to be came from newspaper articles on stories found online about the Dover 8 which described it as being near the old statehouse on the green. This map of Dover from the 1800s, an old Sanborn fire insurance map, places it just a few feet away from the old Capitol building, approximately where this building currently stands, which is a part of the Biggs Museum. Those that pass by have no clue that they are walking past the location of one of the most pivotal moments in the history of the Underground Railroad. 
The conspirators' plan went off script because Otwell had arrived at Dover Jail later than expected. Sheriff Green of Dover was supposed to be waiting with Hollis when they got there, ready to lock the fugitives behind bars. But Sheriff Green had given up on Otwell at 2 a.m. and headed to his quarters to get some sleep. When Otwell finally appeared at the jail with the runaway slaves at 4 a.m., he led them up the stairs, mentioning to the group that they were cold but would soon have a good warming. While under the cover of darkness, Otwell's accomplice James Hollis tried to direct the slaves into a room where he could lock them up, but one of the eight, Henry Prado, noticed that the windows in the room were reinforced with iron bars. The runaways chose to stay in the hallway, becoming more suspicious by the minute. Sheriff Green finally appeared as the Dover 8 were in the hallway, but he too was unable to convince them to move from the hallway into what was a prison cell. Unwilling to give up on the plan, the sheriff rushed back to his room to get his gun. Wary of what was really happening, the runaways followed him to his living quarters, which was located in the jail. The sheriff's wife and children were awakened by the commotion and began screaming, scared for their lives. Amidst the growing chaos, Henry Prado sprang into action, throwing a shovel full of hot coals from the fireplace all over the room and into a bed. Buying his companions time to escape, the two women took advantage of the distraction and climbed out of the window, dropping 12 feet to the ground. Prado then picked up an iron and smashed out the rest of the window and bought time for the other men to jump, keeping the sheriff and Hollis at bay while his companions scrambled to safety. Prado was able to shove the sheriff back enough to make a run for the window, jumping out in the nick of time. By the time he made it to the ground, the rest of the party had fled, however. Though he made it safely to the ground, he still had to scale the wall that surrounded the jail. By the time he cleared the wall, Prado again came face to face with the sheriff. The sheriff stood there, in his stockings, without his shoes, and pointed his pistol directly at Henry. But the gun did not go off, allowing Henry to get away. Having lost his party, Prado fled north alone to the home of Thomas Garrett and became the first of the Dover Eight to make it safely to Philadelphia. Another in the group also separated from the pack amidst the chaos, though it isn't clear whom. The six remaining members decided to retrace their steps, returning along the route that had brought them to Dover. There, south of the jail, they found and overtook Thomas Otwell. Enraged at his betrayal, they threatened to kill him. Otwell begged for his life and he promised to get them back on track, taking them to William Brinkley's home, the station where he was meant to take them in the first place. Hearing of the story from William Brinkley of Camden in a letter and later from the members of the Dover Eight themselves, Station Master Thomas Garrett would later say, It is a wonder that they acted with so much coolness and discretion. One of the men told me he would have killed Otwell at once had he not thought if he did do it he would have less chance to escape than if they committed no act of violence, which no doubt was a correct view. Little is known about what happened to Thomas Otwell after the events of March of 1857. Records found on Ancestry.com prove that the runaways did not kill him. The 1860 census shows that Otwell was alive three years after his betrayal, living near Milford, renting a room from his co-conspirator, Mr. Hollis. The last evidence we could find from his life was an 1863 Civil War draft registration record. There is no record of what came of the Judas of the Underground Railroad thereafter. Despite being free from the jail, the chance for freedom for the runaways was still in peril. If the temptation of a large reward wasn't enough for the slave catchers, their likely route to freedom was narrowed down, making it all the more difficult to make it to safety. In a letter to his cousin, Underground Railroad Station Master Thomas Garrett shared some of the roadblocks the runaways were likely to face in making it to freedom. I have a letter this day from an agent of the Underground Railroad near Dover in this state, saying I must be on the lookout for six brothers and two sisters. They broke jail. Six of them are secreted in the neighborhood and the writer has not known what became of the other two. The six were to start last night for this place. I hear that their owners have persons stationed at several places on the road watching. I fear they will be taken. I shall have two men sent this evening, some four or five miles below, to keep them away from this town and send them, if found, to Chester County. Thee may show this to Still and McKim and oblige thy cousin, Thomas Garrett. 
The local newspaper reported that six of the runaways were tracked to a home in Camden, likely the home of William Brinkley or another member of the Brinkley Hill community. But according to the article, the local magistrates did not believe that they had the authority to issue a warrant for the officers to search the home. The officers were hot on their trail. Moving them north quickly became essential for the runaways and the men helping them. In a letter to the Vigilance Committee of Philadelphia, William Brinkley sheds light on how the group of six were able to make it north. There were six men and two women that was betrayed on the 10th of this month. They had them in prison, but they got out was conveyed by a black man. He told them he would bring them to my house. He had been there before. He has come with Harriet, a woman that stops at my house when she passes to and through. This man led them in Dover prison and left them with a white man, but they tore out the windows and jumped out. So come back to Camden. We put them through. We have to carry them 19 miles and came back the same night. It is too much for our little horses. There is much business done on this road. We have to go through Dover and Smyrna, two worst places on this side of Maryland. There is much to do here. Please to write, I remain your friend, William Brinkley. Using back roads and putting himself in great danger, Brinkley guided six of the Dover eight 19 miles north, conveying them out of the most dangerous area of their journey. The majority of the Dover 8 made it to William Still in Philadelphia, who documented their stories and sent them north to Canada with the Vigilance Committee. Lavina Wolfley was the last of the eight to arrive to William Still's office in Philadelphia. For reasons we are unsure of, she had to separate from her husband on the night of the jail escape and stayed with members of the Underground Railroad for several months, likely recovering from an injury after jumping 12 feet out of the Dover jail window. The Vigilance Committee happily informed her that her husband had made it to freedom in Canada and they helped her to get to him. Each of the eight made it to freedom. For some of them, their known story came to an end once they left William Still's office and set out for Canada. One difficulty in researching the remainder of their lives is that many slaves changed their names when they made it to freedom. After years of living in bondage, they weren't interested in being found and accounted for. Soon, we will share what we know about the rest of their lives, but first the consequences of a successful escape. The slave masters on the eastern shore of Maryland were upset by the amount of slaves that had run away over the previous years. To them, slaves were valuable property whose work contributed to their fortunes. The escape of the Dover 8 was the final straw, and their anger was quickly directed at the free black men who were suspected of helping their slaves flee. Their first target was Minister Samuel Green of East Newmarket. Soon after the escape of the Dover 8, rumors began circulating that Green had played a role in their escape. When the county sheriff searched his home, he found letters from his son who had run away to Canada a few years before. In one letter, two slaves that had run with Harriet Tubman were mentioned along with a map of Canada, train schedules, and a copy of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. He was arrested for having the book, which promoted abolition of slavery, and after his trial was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Samuel Green was released in 1862, having served five years of his sentence on the promise that he would move from Maryland. Harriet Tubman's father, Ben Ross, was also suspected of aiding the Dover 8. Upon hearing her parents were in danger, Tubman rushed back to the eastern shore of Maryland to rescue them. Her parents were in their 70s and could not walk long distances, so she put together a carriage to help transport them to safety. It was the only rescue Harriet Tubman attempted in the summer months. Harriet Tubman only took two more trips to the eastern shore of Maryland after the escape of the Dover 8. Conducting runaway slaves was always dangerous work, but the risks of getting caught went up drastically after the events that happened on the Green of Dover in the March of 1857. For those still in bondage, the American Civil War, whose result would eventually abolish slavery, could not come soon enough. We know the fates of some of the Dover 8 once they made it to freedom, but a few others disappeared to history and time. The hero at the Dover jail, Henry Prideau, disappeared from record after leaving William Still's office. We have been able to find that a man by the name of Henry Prideau with a birth year within the reasonable margin of error was buried in Berlin, Maryland in 1884. It's entirely possible that Henry Prideau made his way back to his family in Maryland after the abolition of slavery. 
It's also possible that the man resting in Berlin, Maryland is a different Henry Prado. Bill and Emily Kaya didn't travel too far from Philadelphia after their escape from the Dover prison. Soon after the escape, they returned to the eastern shore of Maryland to rescue their daughter Mary from slavery. The Kayas eventually settled in Auburn, New York near Harriet Tubman's home and changed their last name to Williams. James Wolfley made it to freedom before his wife did. He had left word with the vigilance committee to let his wife know how to find him. Lavina Wolfley was the last of the Dover Eight to make it to safety. She was informed of where her husband was waiting for her and she was helped in reuniting with him in Canada. Much more is known about the lives of Denard Hughes and Tom Elliott. Upon gaining their freedom, they both settled in St. Catharines in Ontario, a community that welcomed many runaway slaves. Both becoming close associates of Harriet Tubman, they initially volunteered to join John Brown as he planned to attack Virginia to end slavery there. They ultimately decided not to join him on his ill-fated mission in Harper's Ferry. It is unknown what happened to Hughes after his recruitment by Brown. It's possible that he eventually moved to Auburn, New York with many other runaway slaves in the community that he had joined. Tom Elliott appears to have become a right-hand man for Tubman's efforts in the community at St. Catharines. After living in Canada for a few years, he moved down to Auburn, New York, where another ex-slave neighborhood had developed around the Tubman family property. Around 1864, Elliott would marry Harriet Tubman's great-niece, Anne Marie Stewart, with whom he had two daughters. The couple boarded at Harriet Tubman's home in Auburn. Elliot worked as a laborer, likely maintaining connections to the other former Maryland slaves in the city. Family descendants describe Elliot as a hardworking man who worked long hours as a laborer and a whitewasher to provide for his family. They report that he had quite a different life from the one he lived on the eastern shore of Maryland. Thomas Elliott passed away on October 2nd, 1884. In 2010, on the 126th anniversary of his passing, his descendants held a ceremony for him. Having found his final resting place with the help from Craig Williams from the New York State Museum, they replaced his grave marker with one that commemorated his involvement in the historic story of the Dover Eight. Often, the great stories in history are well documented and become stuff of legend. Their tales are shared from generation to generation. Hollywood makes films about them and they become a living part of the American past. But sometimes, you have to dig a bit to find a great story. We owe it to the brave men and women whose sacrifices helped shape the America that we live in today. It's important to remember their stories so that they will never be forgotten. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe.